Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> this morning I want to talk about repentance. Well, we've heard that a lot, preacher. We're going to really try to look at repentance this morning. <clears throat> when we turn from sin, when we repent, we're going to go all the way back to Psalms chapter 51, 1 through 4. We know that sin separates us from God. We know that there will be no sin in heaven. So is repentance necessary? If we want to go to heaven, it is. Here David, right before this, realized his sin. You remember the story about Nathan coming to King David. He gave him the story about the little ewe lamb. He said there was a rich man that had all kinds of sheep. And he was going to have a feast. And he sent men to this man's house and he only had one little ewe lamb, a little pet lamb. Reminded me of my little pet cat. Most people don't like cats. Well, I didn't either, but now I love my cat. But I'm sure this man loved his little ewe lamb. It was his little pet. It was like part of the family. The man came in and took what that man, and that's all he had, took it away from him, went back his little pet now. Killed it, cooked it, and ate it. Ooh. Could that hurt or what? Well, King David got mad. He said, who is this man? And Nathan said, it is you, King David. King David had done something just like that. He had taken the wife of one of his great soldiers. And that's all that soldier had. It was his life, his family. Took it away from him. Mm. It's, a, it's a terrible, terrible story about King David, a man after God's own heart. How, how rotten can a man be? But he did. Now we're going to look at Psalms 51 through, 51, 1 through 4, and see the inner thoughts of David and see if we can glean anything from these and apply it our own lives. Here it says in verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God. I can see David here from the most inner parts of his body begging God, Have mercy on me, O God, when he finally realized what he had done. He'd been caught up in so deep in sin, he couldn't see what was in front of him. And now, the realization of, Oh, according to your loving kindness, O Father, According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, get rid of my sins, please God. Wash me. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, my sin. Cleanse me from all my sin. I acknowledge my transgressions. I acknowledge my sins to you, O oh God, because my sin is always before me. What do you mean by that? David, he was saying there is it's with me day and night. It's eating me from the inside out. The guilt I hurt against you, you only have I sinned, God, and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. I want to be found not guilty at the end of time, and I'm begging. For your forgiveness, Lord, because I truly repent. Repentance is probably the most difficult of all God's commands <coughs> because it does require a change of action, a change in your life, a change in the way that you do things, the way you think, as well as a change in your very own heart. So difficult is it that many have attempted to substitute a genuine repentance with a poor and rather easy imitation. Give me an example of that, preacher. What would you think that might be? Well, if I haven't really repented in my actions in my heart, I'm just doing it for show. It might be, well, now I show up for church about once a week. And by the way, when I walk in the door, I'm going to put on my church face. And when I walk out, I'm going to take it off and become who I really am. 
We easily know what a genuine repentance is and what a imitation of it is. Because we can see it in other people, but can we see it here in ourselves? It's a different story. Let's turn to an example of genuine repentance and see what we can learn about it. We must be honest with our own selves, hadn't we? We often use euphemisms to soothe our conscience and make ourselves, well, believe that what I have done or my problems, my sins, are really not all that bad. Here's some words you might have heard or maybe used yourself. Words like, well, you know, the problem is I've always been that way. It's just me. I mean, you know, I don't think it's all that bad. Well, if this is the only bad habit I've got, I think I'm okay. Oh, well, that softened it up. Now it's it's not a black sin, it's just sort of a gray sin. There'll be no gray sins in heaven. There won't even be any white sins in heaven. You've heard the little white lies? Uh, there will be no sin in heaven. Instead of calling our unrighteousness, unfaithfulness to God Almighty, sin, we soften that by calling them mistakes. Well, I made a mistake. I, I got a little weakness here. I, I got a few problems, but it's not all that bad. You see, in these four verses that we're reading of King David, he didn't make any excuses. He admits at least six times in the first four verses of Psalm 51, his sin. We got to own our sin. We got to. We got to look at ourselves and own it. Quit trying to find fault out here and look in here. This is where I need to be clean. I want you to go to heaven and I want to try to teach and preach the best I can, but you know what? I want to go to heaven. I want to be there. My iniquity, my sin, he says. My sin. And in other words, there was no attempt here to try to shift the blame. We hear that all day today. Well, the reason that I am the way I am is uh, because of the way I was raised or because of the people I work with or the people that I hang around with or this person made me mad and yes, I said I reacted, but it's really their fault, not mine. I don't think that'll fly on judgment day to Now, you know, David could have done the same thing. He walks out on the deck at night, looks and there's Bathsheba bathing. It's her fault that I sinned. It's her fault that I lusted. It's her fault that I had my wonderful soldier withdrawn from in battle and killed. It's her fault that I lied. It's her fault that I deceived everybody. It's her fault that I let God down. It's, it's my fault, David says. Nobody's fault but mine. We must try, we must stop trying to hide our own sins. Psalm 51 6. Behold, you desire truth in my inner parts. God, I know that you can see in here and you want the truth out of me. You don't want nothing fake. And in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. Way down deep inside in my conscience. It's down deep in my conscience that I'm troubled. This is what's waking me up. This is where I walk around uneasy with a grin, not on my face, but a frown. I'm, I'm worried, I'm concerned about all these people know about me. The repentant person doesn't have a double life. One for show and then one for himself. One at church and then one when we're away from church. No church face and no real face. It's just one face. That's what we've got to strive for, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Amen. We must want God back in our lives. I want God back. Psalms 51, 11 and 12. Do not cast me away from your presence, O God. David again, from deep in his soul, still praying, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Why? Restore my joy of your salvation. I want to be happy again. I want to be able to lay down at night and go to sleep with a grin on my face and thankfulness in my heart that I have done what I'm supposed to do and I'm right in your sight now, God, and I find favor from you. I want to have joy. Your salvation and uphold me by your generous Holy Spirit, O oh Lord. You know, uh, a real repentant person is not absorbed in his self, 
thinking uh, of God and how our sins have affected Him over a relationship with Him and the joy of being right with God, everything in His mind, His heart, His soul, in His actions, His thinking, the words that come out, the, the outreach of fellowship, the outreach of joy, it's not wrapped up in the sinful temptations of myself and I'm not strong enough to repent. No, I find it in pure righteousness. And the only way I can be there is to do like David. Really repent. Really change. And ask God to forgive me. We must be concerned for others. I thought this was all about self. You want to go to heaven, you better be worried about others too. Psalms 51, 13 through 15. And if you do this for me, Lord, if you give me another chance, I will teach the transgressors, those that sin, your ways. You cleanse me, Lord, and I will stand up and be a soldier for you. I will spend the rest of my days as Paul did, trying my best to fight for what's right in your sight. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O oh God. The God of my salvation. I do want to worry about, be concerned about other souls. I have to be. My tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Oh Lord, just give me another chance. Oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. Many of the most faithful, loyal Christians that you have ever known or ever will meet in your life oftentimes are those that partook of the same sin that they hate now, that they fight against. But why do they, why do they fight so hard? Because they lived in that time of their life when it was sickening and their conscience just burned them alive. And now here they are. They broke free from sin through the grace of God, through the obedience of their faith, and through repentance every day of their lives. And they're experiencing a joy that they want to share with everybody they can. Yes, those are the people that will stand strong for God. Those are the real soldiers of Christ. They've been in the mire and the mud. Not no more. Not no more. We must be broken Psalm 51, 16 and 17. David says, For you do not desire sacrifice. Here, let me put a little more money in the tray. Here, let me start going to church a little bit more often. Let me, let me put on a little bit better show. You do not desire sacrifice or else I'd give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. I can't give enough. The sacrifices of God that He wants or a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. That's me, Father, on my knees with tears in my eyes and my heart beating 100 miles an hour begging you for forgiveness. I want to change. I want to stand up from this floor, put on the armor of God and go to war for you, O oh Lord. Repentance is more than just some rope ritual. Friends don't play games with repentance. It's nothing to play games with. Pretending to repent won't work. Let us not mock God by trying to act like something we're not. Pretending to be what we are not. We can change all that. We can change all that in an instant. <laughs> Hebrews 6, 3 through 6. Listen closely. For those of you that worship here, sometimes my sermons are rather long. This morning, I did not want to tank this sermon at all. I've got one point to make. And with God's help and blessings, I will make that point. Hebrews 6, 3-6. through 6. And this we will do. We will repent. We will do right if God permits. Why? For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, who heard the Word of God and believed it with all their heart, were baptized for the remission of their sins, rose a brand new creature and walked anew with a clean conscience, broke, broke loose from sin. Here I stand, a Christian, 
I was once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and become a partaker of the Holy Spirit. I had the gift of the Holy Spirit in baptism, Acts 2.38. I have tasted the good Word of God and the powers of the age to come. This scares us all. If they fall away. Oh, I don't think you can fall away. Well, you need to rewrite the book. If they fall away, to renew them again to repentance. Since they crucify again for themselves in their own heart and in their life, the Son of God Himself, and put Him to an open shame. What does that mean? When I was a sinner, acted like a sinner, thought as a sinner, I didn't put on any, any false show for anybody. I was just a sinner. People expected that of me. But now that I am a Christian, now that I am a child of God, the whole eyes of everyone are upon me. And I do not want to crucify Jesus Christ in my life and in my ways, in my, my unwillingness to change. Yes, as a Christian, I can see now why when I fall away, I won't repent. I put Jesus Christ Himself back on that cross in front of everybody and stand up and holler, it's all my fault and I don't care. Because I'm not willing to repent. I'm not willing to change. I put Him to an open shame. If this verse don't wake us up, what will, brothers and sisters? Nothing will. I want you to remember Psalms 51, 17. Now, what I'm fixing to share with you is this verse right here, <coughs> verse 6. If they fall away to renew them again to repentance, they crucify again the, the Son of God. Verse 4, it is impossible for those who were one. In other words, if I fall away, I can never come back. There's no use in me even thinking about repenting, even trying to change. It's not what it's talking about. Is talking about when you get so far gone and so wrapped up in yourself and you don't love anybody else enough to repent, what you're actually saying is, I don't care about anybody else and they can't nobody reach you then. Your heart is stone. Your ears are deaf. Your eyes are blind. And nobody can seem to get through to you. Well, what if they do? If they do... That's where you remember Psalms 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Are you broken inside? Have you hit your knees yet? A broken and contrite heart. A heart that is just bleeding. It's breaking. My conscience bothers me. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Once I've hit my knees, even though I've gone that far away, I can come back. Read 1 John 1 9 in your Bible. If I confess my sins, that's you too, brother and sister. If you confess your sins to God, He's faithful, always faithful, and always just to forgive your sins. He's just because He's a just God. He will make just judgments. Which means He will abide by His own Word. He don't lie. If you confess your sins to God with a contrite heart, a broken spirit on your knees, physically or just mentally, begging for forgiveness and willing to change, He'll forgive you. He will forgive you. But it's got to be real. Hebrews 8.12 what happens now? Now that I've been forgiven, I'm going to walk through life feeling awful for the rest of my life. Probably the way King David did. No, 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 no. Remember, King David was a man after God's own heart. He believed God's Word. He believed when he changed and repented that he could continue then in his walk of life, walking, serving God above, and he did. You know what? We need to do the same thing. 
We need to remember Hebrews 8. <coughs> when, when we get our sins forgiven and we finally really repent, trying everything in our power to change what is ever holding us back, the chains that the devil has on us, we break those chains. And once we've done that, He will never hold those sins against us again. It doesn't say that He'll never hold future sins, but those sins to that point are gone. Now stand up and shake yourself off, soldier. Accept the forgiveness of God Almighty. Put your chest out and your shoulders back. Grab this book, The Sword of Life, and you start swinging it and cutting hearts in two with the truth and love of God and try to save souls. And in doing so, you'll be trying to save them. <coughs> this is as short of a sermon as I have ever given at this congregation. And you know what? If you've listened to the Word of God and God teaching this lesson, it can't be much stronger. I don't see how it could. God's Word should cut our hearts in two. If you have a need this morning, any way at all, whether you just need the prayers of the church or you need to confess your sins in a public way, then you come forward as we stand and sing, but if you just need to repent of your sins, you do it where you are and do it now. Thank you. Just as I am.